to the last talk. Um, okay, the, the speaker is uh, Professor Zerbi, uh, who is the uh, Director General of INAF. Scientific Director. Scientific Director General of INAF. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll be talking of uh, uh, the challenges and of the new big data and big telescopes. Okay, where is the... here. Okay, good morning. So beyond the title, I'm here to bring to the discussion the point of view of ENAF. And ENAF uh, is the National Institute of Astrophysics. And this is uh, basically the scope of our institute. We're, we're about 1,100 scientists and technicians that are working in astrophysics and astronomy together with other uh, entities in Italy and all around the world. And our purpose is to carry out, promote, and exploit the scientific and technological research in the field of astronomy and astrophysics and also promote and favor the transfer of internally developed technologies to industries and doing this by pursuing the excellence at the international level. So we are sort of users of an archive and producers of data that go into an archive and we do have our own archives. So as an, as an institute we are in a threefold situation in which we produce data that goes into an archive, we have our own archive and we use the data of our own archive and archive from, from somebody else. Uh, concerning space astrophysics, of course, we have collaboration with space agency, mainly with ASI, which is the one in our own nation, but also with ESA, NASA, JAXA, and others, in the development, construction, operation, and data exploitation of space missions, basically for astrophysics and the observation of the universe and the exploration of the solar system. So we develop jointly with space agencies key technologies to enable and or improve scientific payloads for space mission, but on top, as it was also discussed by um, Enrico Russo this morning, we contribute to the space astrophysics data handling, such as, for instance, here in ASI with the SSDC, formerly ASDC, now renamed S um, SSDC, together with the National Institute of uh, Nuclear Physics. I'm not going to cover this because, of course, it's covered by many other colleagues during this discussion. And I just want to focus a bit more on what is our core business, which is the ground base, and starting from optical ground base. Optical ground base, of course, we Italy is part of ESO through ENAF, who is the player that joins the country with ESO, and there's access to ESO facilities, such as the VLT that you can see here, but we have seen already from the colleague this morning. And uh, I, I just highlighted the fact that it includes the VST, because VST has a special status, it's an ESO telescope that is owned by Italy and by ENAF, and we have a lot of access, specific access to this large producer of data. We contribute to ESO telescopes, set of instrumentation. Some of the, you might remember two speakers ago, a lot of instruments there in the slide, and some of those, of course, have been produced with the enough contributions. And these, of course, include production pipelines. So it's not only hardware, it's hardware, but up to science. So also data and handling the data and preserving the data. And we are also active part of the ESO user community on fresh data, so making our own observation, and also on archive data, so accessing the ESO archive and making science with archive data. We also operate our own proprietary facilities, either wall or per share. Among these, the, the Telescopio Nazionale Galileo in the Palma is a four-meter telescope, which is rather famous because it hosts the harp instrument from Geneva Observatory, exactly the copy of the one in the south, and it's a planet, exoplanet uh, hunter and the large binocular telescope in Arizona, together with the University of Arizona and other USA partners. Also, we are involved in radio, and radio, we operate single-dish antennas in the Medicina Observatory, close to Bologna and Noto in Sicily, and the Sardini Radio Telescope, together with ASI, near Cagliari. And these antennas are part of the VLBI network, so uh, all the data is uh, in, in that kind of context. And of course, through ESO, we have access to ALMA, and uh, we also have an ALMA regional center in Italy located in Bologna for the data handling of ALMA. Uh, the last but not least uh, is the newly discovered ground-based gamma observatories. Uh, we are, of course, part of CTA, as we will see, but we are also part of the MAGIC collaboration and of the Pierre Roger Observatory in Argentina, which are basically two, together with Hess and Veritas and others, are the first attempt to make uh, very high energy uh, astronomy from ground uh, through the Cherenkov telescopes or equivalent. 
future infrastructures in the area of optical near and, and infrared, in the area of radio, and in the area of uh, gamma ray ground based observatory are, of course, the European Extremely Large Telescope, which is, as we learned this morning, is a, we, we will have the first stone in one month in uh, Cerro Armazones close to Paranal. The square kilometer array, this, is this large array of radio telescope covering part of, North, uh, of South Africa and, and Australia, and the Cherenkov telescope array that will also be located on the southern side very close to the EELT and in the northern side in La Palma, who is the, with more than 100 single Cherenkov telescopes, will be the first real observatory uh, for doing gamma ray uh, observations from the ground. So, uh, astrophysical data in ENAF, as I told you, the ENAF community, as any other communities in astrophysics, is at the same time a producer and a user of astronomical data. So we have this twofold of the fact that we inject things into the database, but you also want to get to retrieve these things from the database. And obviously, not the only, that's, that, that specific thing, but something else uh, to complete our uh, scientific research. And uh, we, we seek and foster, by all means, data preservation, data open accessibility, and data interoperability. And these three keywords are very well suited with three of the objectives and, and uh, that are listed in the Open Universe proposal. Uh, number one, two, and three, promoting the robust provision and permanent preservation of science-ready data, advancing calibration quality and statistical integrity, and also fostering the development of new centralized services, both large and small, to exploit the interconnectedness of modern, modern internet through the web-ready data. Of course, I think that uh, it is in our hearts and will uh, to, to be as much co cooperative and collaborative as possible to this kind of vision on how things should go. So the key questions for us uh, that I would briefly would like to, to, to share with you and also for the discussion later on and tomorrow is uh, what should we preserve? So what is the, when we call science-ready data, what do we mean as science-ready data? And the second question is for how long should it be preserved, which is another important question. And then why should we make it available and to whom should we make it available? These are basically the four questions that are underneath all the discussion of these days and I would like to provide enough five cents of, of, of knowledge on these things or, or at least our desiderata. And I would start so on what should we preserve? I mean, as a matter of fact, the concept of science ready data in astrophysics is debatable. It, it has always been debatable and is debatable, debatable even now. And I would like to use an example. Uh, many, but not all, the astronomical data comes from the equivalent of trolling, fishing through trolling. You have these nets and you get a lot of fishes. Of course, uh, what we get is not, doesn't look like this picture, but it looks like this picture, which is probably the most famous picture of a net full of fishes that astrophysics have ever produced, which is the double deep field. But any time that you have something in which you distinguish or disentangle something that you call noise with respect to some, on something that you call, sorry, signal, with respect to something that you call noise, you might have smaller fishes in the noise. One of the most important examples is the, for some of you it's perhaps very well known, is the relationship between exoplanet search and astroseismology. Astroseismology was a signal for somebody and became noise for somebody else, but extremely important noise to be uh, used for, for the, the reduction of, in, uh, of uh, the data in, in exoplanetary search. So the point is that when you make a pipeline and you define what is science ready, you select in the net the fish that you want to eat, but that doesn't mean that other fishes are suited to somebody else's soup. So the problem that we have when we do this is that the, you, you project the subject, or at least what you're looking for, into the pipeline and you select from the net the fishes that you think that are you know, usable, useful, important, perhaps leaving something else behind. And since uh, science ready pipeline could restrict the potential use of other users or future users, so other users, users in the same time, or future users because science goes ahead and something that is not considered important now could be considered important in the next future. So why make data available? Well, this is rather obvious. The net almost always catches more fishes than the fisherman can or wishes to eat. This is the point. Sorry for talking about fishes, but we are close to lunch, so I think that is, <laughs> is appreciated. And the point is that uh, there are, however, a lot of less fortunate fishermen, and we are here in an initiative that is sponsored by the United Nations, and we have a lot of underdeveloped countries that cannot have access to very expensive infrastructures, but they could have access to an open 
in, in, open, in, in open cloud or whatever you want to call it, an open database, to do their research. And they could enjoy the meal if invited. So this is certainly one of the reasons why we have to go public, not the only one. The point is that data like fishes stink after some time. There is we, we all know that. There is no advantage to keep them reserved if the owner cannot use them because of lack of manpower, because of lack of knowledge, because of lack of interest. So this is the reason why most of the providers that are sitting here in this room, but all the others, they limit the, the, the proprietary pe period to a certain amount of time, because then after that amount of time, the fish stink. That's the point. Available to whom? Well, tuna fish hunters will not know what to do with the codfish. That, that this is the first problem, by chance in the net. So restricted access does not maximize science return. Because if there's restricted access to a group of people, they will only see what they want to see. They don't see, they don't understand that is inside the same group of data. Moreover, and this is extremely important for astrophysics, is that something strange or serendipitous may be falling in the net. One would not even consider a fish, like a boot, for instance. But then you don't know now that this is useful. You don't know now that this is scientifically viable, but you may know in, certain, in some time. A specimen, a specimen of a new species that will be classified only years later. That's an issue. So in order to maximize, to maximize the outcome to the catch, should be made available to all and preserved for the longest possible time. But what do we mean for longest possible time? And here we have a philosophical problem, because astronomers are interested in preserving their data in time scales longer than any possible reference of the digital era. And this is a clear example. Idea in a scale of millennia. This, I think, below the Anasazi recording of the supernova of, the, of um, 1054, it's, it's really bit preservation. I mean, I, a human being, have testified the existence of a star that is brighter, brighter than the moon. The message is clear. It's on a stone, it's not on a bit, it's not on a tape, but it's there. So th this, this, this of the how long is extremely important for us, because we are all, all, all even today, considering uh, useful something that goes back 1,000 years before us. And so this is a, a challenge in this sense. Of course, the interoperability of data is extremely important. I don't want to go into details about interoperability under the informatic point of view. So how much the things should be correlated in terms of databases or have the same header or whatever. Let's go to the very basic. I mean, the point is that we astrophysics is a natural science. It's also physics, it's also, but it's also a natural science because we observe the nature without manipulating it. That's the point. When nature often surprises us and the science for which serendipity is a central concept. So an important point for us is correlation. Correlation is essential. Astrophysics is multi-wavelength. Recently, is also multi-messenger, when gravitational waves and neutrino came in play. But so the, the most of the advancement in science and astrophysics come from correlation. The two examples here are quite evident. is the, the afterglow of a gamma ray burst, we have seen also from, uh, from a colleague this morning, or the case of the gravitational waves. So what is extremely important in these databases is that data collected with different observing equipment are interoperable at the very basic uh, idea if the position of the source is known with known precisions, possibly down to milliseconds, if the time of the emission is known with great precision, possibly milliseconds, because now we are in the time of time domain astronomy. So also the, the constraints uh, before thinking about how, how to archive this data which is more on how to produce these data in order to be interoperable, it's also important. Because if we, never, if, we, if, we don't have a if we don't have a benchmark in time that is precise enough, or a benchmark in space which is precise enough, then the interoperability of this data later will be limited. So I just want to, to go to the root of the problem. Then the rest is informatics. I understand it's extremely important. But we also have a root of the problem here in interoperability. And this is just an example that was already shown by, by Paolo this morning. I probably this is another Markarian, this one, not, not, not 4 to 1, but it doesn't matter. But this is a clear idea. And wh where do we gain by having interoperable data? Is because we can make plot like this. It's just an example. So, uh, of course, ENAF is not you know, a spectator on this. We are doing something. We are uh, taking part in all the at, at European side, at least in all the initiatives that are fostering this kind of, uh, uh, of attitude, such as Asterix and Obelix, EOSC Pilot, Indico Data Cloud, and others. And, uh, and the conclusion for me is that the definition of science ready data that preserves serendipity and post analysis is, imp is important. So when we want to archive something, we can, of course, give web access to the very final stage of a pipeline 
but we have to keep and preserve also the possibility to reaccess later the bulk of not perhaps fully raw, but at least uh, at least uh, data that can be analyzed, and so preserving the possible serendipity analysis and the post analysis. Easy access and operability of databases is of course another keyword for us. And the database open to everybody in the short possible time is also something that is desirable. And data preserved for the longest possible time. I understand that millennia is something that we cannot work with, but of course put into in mind that the preservation for a long time is extremely important. And uh, interoperability in mind. Thanks. Thank you. Questions? Comments? Well, I have a comment. I really enjoyed your fish talk. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I think the point you made actually in uh, not preserving the, 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 the picture you put on AppJ is very important yeah. because we want to have this as a live set of data that we can uh, use for further science. And so there are different aspects, but uh, the point of preserving the full scientific power of the data is good. Okay, thank you. Thank you, and now I think we finished for the morning session. Uh, we have a lunch break, and back here at 2.20.